It's not often that I get the privilege of introducing a jailbird. It's also not often that I get a chance to introduce a real heroine of journalism, a person who serves as a role model to aspiring journalists because she refused to divulge her sources. Judith Miller is an author and Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter, formerly with the New York Times, who spent 85 days in jail for protecting her sources. For this, she received the Society of Professional Journalists First Amendment Award. Since leaving jail, she has been advocating the enactment of a federal shield law to protect the relationship between reporters and their sources and the public's right to know. Judith Miller has had a rich journalistic career. Just a few highlights. In 1983, she became the first woman to be named chief of the Times Bureau in Cairo, responsible for covering the Arab world. In 1986, she became the Paris correspondent, traveling throughout Europe and North Africa. During the Iraq War, she was the only reporter to be embedded for four months with the 75th Expeditionary Task Force, the multi-service unit, whose sensitive mission was to hunt for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Judith Miller is now an adjunct fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of its magazine, City Journal. Since 2008, she has been a, a commentator for Fox News, speaking on terrorism and other national security issues, the Middle East, American foreign policy, and the need to strike a delicate balance between protecting both national security and civil liberties in a post 9-11 world. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to welcome Judith Miller to speak on protecting sources and national security. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming to a lecture in English. <laughs> And I'm sorry that I was unable to attend the previous lecture because I would like to hear how my Israeli colleagues do it. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here at Bar Ilan and I'm delighted to be among you and among the free, if not the brave. Uh, and I want to talk today about an issue that concerns everyone who lives in a democracy, be it on my side of the Atlantic or yours and that is the need to balance national security against civil liberties. And this week is a momentous week, judicially speaking, in the United States because this is the week in which Bradley Manning, our 25-year-old private, is going, has gone on trial in connection with uh, the largest leak of classified documents in American history. Uh, Private Manning is not in a civilian court. He is in a military court. And he is not going to be heard by a jury of his peers, but by a judge, which is the option that he has chosen. But I think this case is going to be very relevant to civilian journalists and very important to the issue that we're addressing today, which is this balance between national security and freedom of thought and of speech. What you think of Bradley Manning depends a lot on where you are on the American political spectrum. To those who defend him, he's a whistleblower, or as his lawyers said yesterday, a humanist who wanted to explode, explore and explode what America was doing in Iraq and Afghanistan in the name of promoting democracy and American security. He saw his country as one that was engaging in bloodlust. He is a person who cares about all people, his defense attorney said. The government has a different view. The government's view is that he's a traitor he was a soldier who systematically downloaded classified information while sitting in Iraq. He didn't distinguish between information that made his country look bad, that is the 
uh, illegal or uh, unethical actions that it was taken in his view. But he downloaded 250,000 diplomatic cables, 500,000 military reports. The prosecutors will tell this judge that Bradley Manning actually gave documents to the enemy. He is accused of conspiring with, aiding and abetting the enemy, providing information to the enemy. And in this case, the prosecution says it will prove that Osama bin Laden requested downloaded documents from the WikiLeaks cache. That will be the essence of their case. I haven't heard enough of the evidence at this point about Bradley Manning's motives or what he wanted to do. His defense attorneys say he was also struggling with personal issues, being gay in the military. There's going to be a lot said in this court at Fort Meade, Maryland this summer. The trial will go on the entire summer. But I think the way in which the judge decides this will have implications for everyone who practices journalism in America. It almost has to by the nature of this case and how much is involved. Now, some of the cables that have been disclosed, and when the New York Times, my former paper, began publishing this information, many of us said, what is the big deal here? Were we really shocked to learn, would you be shocked to learn that American diplomats had called Vladimir Putin Russia's alpha dog? or that Germany's Angela Merkel was described as a leader who avoids lists, risk and is seldom creative? Would you be stunned to learn that Ahmadinejad was described by Prince Zayed, uh, that is Mohammed bin Zayed al Nayan, as a man who is the equivalent of Hitler? No. Would you be surprised in Israel to learn that Ehud Barak told an American diplomat that there was a window of between six and 18 months in which stopping Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon might still be viable? I think we're a little past that deadline now. All of this, or much of this, that made headlines in the United States was pretty well known to the astute reader of local papers or even online papers. So I don't think that we were shocked, shocked to learn much of what was in the WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks cables, but I can tell you that some of the sources with whom Americans were dealing overseas had to be moved. They had to, in some cases, leave their countries in order to be a certain assured of safety. We don't know if anyone was killed as a result of WikiLeaks, but I'm sure if that's happened, the prosecutors will try and make the case. But we do know that American senators and congressmen have said that WikiLeaks, and therefore Bradley Manning, uh, has blood on his hands for what he's done. This case may sound somewhat familiar to Americans, uh, to Israelis. You too have a case involving a soldier. I do not know enough about that case to pass judgment on what's happened in this instance. But I do know the issue we're, we're wrestling with, which is the disclosure of massive amounts of information in modern times because of the internet, because of disks, because of this kind of technology, is not going to be an aberration. It's going to be the wave of the future. And governments and journalists have to decide how much of this is a good or a bad thing. Why am I worried about WikiLeaks? I am less worried about the fate of Bradley Manning, to be frank though I haven't made up my mind how I feel about him, than I am about what I consider the other shoe that hasn't dropped. And that is the potential prosecution of Julian Assange for publishing this information. Now the US government has not decided whether or not it's going to take legal action against him, but Mr. Assange <coughs> is holed up in the uh, embassy of uh, Ecuador. 
He's been granted asylum by Ecuador because he feels the Americans are going to take judicial action against him. I have strong views about Mr. Assange. I may not like him personally, but I consider him a publisher. And I consider it very dangerous for the United States government to take action against him if it chooses that particular course. He doesn't have a newspaper, but he has something just as powerful. He has an internet platform from which all of this material was downloaded and published. If he is not a publisher, there are no publishers in the 21st century. And therefore, as much as I may dislike his attitudes towards my country, I feel honor bound as someone who believes in free speech and a free press to defend him and to hope that my government will not pursue this action. Why am I worried that they will? I'm worried that they will because of two cases that you may not heard and have heard an awful lot about, but you're going to hear more about them. And that is the Justice Department under President Barack Obama's decision to see, seek and obtain secretly search warrants and subpoenas for the telephone records and emails of my colleagues. The first case involved the Associated Press. Now, the Justice Department was forced to disclose by American law 90 days after it had done so that it had secretly gotten two months of office, home, and cell phone records from Associated Press journalists as part of a leak investigation. Who leaked the name or who leaked the existence of a plot to blow up uh, an Al-Qaeda plot to blow up an American airline or that was bound from the Middle East, Yemen in fact, to the United States. I don't want to minimize the list, the danger of this leak to national security. This was a very bad leak. Why? Because America doesn't have many agents inside of Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda affiliates. But the Brits and the Saudis together had such an agent, and his identity was compromised not by the original leak of the information to the Associated Press, but by subsequent digging into how this plot to blow up the American airliner was foiled. This is basically the, the background. Uh, from uh, April and May of 20, uh, in 2012, the Associated Press ran a story about the foiling of this plot to blow up the American airliner. The AP was asked by the U.S. government not to run this story. And for five days, they worked with the government until the, quote, national security danger which we're not even certain the AP knew precisely what it was, had passed. On the sixth day, the White House announced that they wanted to be the ones to make the announcement of the foiling of this plot. Now, whether they wanted to do it because they thought they could still protect the agent and keep him in play, or whether they wanted to do it because they wanted to take credit for the foiling of a plot, we do not know. All we know is the Associated Press, which had sat on this story for five days, said, no, 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 we're going to publish our version of this story, and they did. After that, the Los Angeles Times was the publication that published the fact that there had been an agent involved in the foiling of this plot, not the Associated Press originally. Nevertheless, the government thought that it would pursue the identity of the leaker by going after the Associated Press reporters, five of them who had worked on the stories connected with the foiling of this plot. That involved getting secret warrants for the seizure of the records of 20 different telephone lines in the Associated Press, including the Associated Press line in the Congress. The problem with this request was that the Congress had never been briefed on this plot. So the intelligence committees that oversee intelligence for the Congress had no knowledge of this plot. So why would the government want the AP's records 
telephone records from the congressional office, the main office in New York, the office in Hartford, the Hoff office in Boston, the office in Washington. 20 different records that provided telephone records to and from the phones of 100 different Associated Press journalists. Ladies and gentlemen, the Associated Press is the largest news organization in the United States. If you can chill people who talk to AP reporters, you can pretty much control a lot of the press. The government says that wasn't its intention. Its intention was to find the leaker. We don't know whether or not they have done so. But what we do know is that the AP responded with fury and accused the government of gross overreaching, of an unprecedented invasion of the privacy and the security and the way we do business as journalists. And much of the press, both on the left and the right, have stood with the AP. That was the first case. The second pay, c c case was even closer to home because it involved, for me, a colleague of mine at Fox News. Now, I'm not speaking for Fox News, and this is a very sensitive issue. I'm speaking as an individual who has been through what my fellow reporter James Rosen is now going through. After I came out of jail, in 2005, the same prosecutor who put me in jail had issued subpoenas for my records. The only difference, telephone records, in another leak investigation. So I got out of jail only to start fighting another case that received much less publicity because that time I didn't go to jail. <laughs> but in the end, the court sided with the government and my records and those of a colleague were turned over to uh, the government, and Patrick Fitzgerald, the special prosecutor, went all through them looking for the leaker. I am happy to say he did not succeed. However, James Rosen, my colleague, has not been so lucky, apparently, because I had a chance to fight that subpoena. James Rosen and Fox News never even knew about it until it became public inadvertently because of a disclosure of documents in the case. And here's what happened. In 2009, James Rosen reported that the CIA believed that North Korea, based on, quote, sources inside North Korea, and that was the problem, they, the CIA believed that if the United uh, Nations responded with sanctions uh, because of its nuclear test, North Korea would set off another atomic bomb. That seems kind of taken for granted by most of us, but once again, it was the reference to sources inside North Korea that was problematic for the US government. Rather than do what prosecutors normally do, which is to go to the news organization and say, we want James Rosen's telephone records, they issued a secret subpoena and warrant for those records. And they made a very unusual and, in my view, very, very dangerous argument. They said that because James Rosen had flattered his source and because he had solicited information from his source, he was guilty not only of uh, solicitation of classified information, but he was actually a spy himself. He was being investigated as a potential traitor under the Espionage Act of 1917, an act that has been used only three times successfully under previous presidents, but now six times under President Obama, this president who believes so much in transparency and open and fair go government. James Rosen never knew about this, but his source did. Because immediately, James Rosen's State Department pass was used to track his movements through the building during that period. Based on that and based on the classification of the document, the, gov the government was able to trace back the number of people who had access to this very sensitive report. They 
actually identified and indicted someone for it. But they had all of James's correspondence with this alleged source who has now been charged. His name is Stephen Kim. He denies that he was responsible for the leak. But they understood what James was doing, so why did they need his telephone number, all of his telephone conversations, including those of his parents, apparently? though the government denies this. One of the numbers subpoenaed was on, on Long Island, and the first six digits just happened to correspond to the first nine digits, six digits of the nine-digit number of James Rosen's parents. So all of these records were turned over, and none of us knew about it until long after the fact. And the question I asked was not only how can the Attorney General of our country, Eric Holder, sign a warrant seeking this secret seizure of documents and records from Rosen and accuse someone engaged in the act of journalism of committing a crime? When we do this, we've crossed a very, very dangerous line in the United States. And the fact that President Obama has said he was troubled by this incident should be interesting because the President is rarely troubled by invasions of personal privacy. He was troubled by only two such things. One, the use of the IRS for blatantly political purposes to move against his political enemies before the election. That troubled him. And then he was troubled by this case, and he asked that the Justice Department procedures in this case be investigated. By whom? By the Attorney General, the head of the Justice Department. So we have a very, very unpleasant situation brewing. Now, I think this is, it's interesting to me because at the time of this leak, the government's, the president's advisors were openly saying that Fox News or, was not a news organization. It was trying to delegitimize the news company that I work for, saying it was just an attack dog for the Republican Party. The news on Fox News is labeled news. The commentary, which is seen at night by many more Americans, is clearly labeled commentary. But if Fox News is not a news organization, then neither is the AP, the New York Times, or any other news organization that offers its readers or viewers both commentary and news. This, too, is a very, very dangerous procedure. What does this mean for us, these three cases, Bradley Manning, the AP, and James Rosen? It means that people like me are going to have to be even more careful, and you've just heard the previous uh, journalists talk about their techniques, but now people like me will be using drop boxes, disposable cell phones, encryption technology. This is the stuff of drug dealers. This is not normally the stuff of the craft of journalism. But that's what's happen happening if you attempt not only to invade our privacy and chill sources so to such an extent that no one's ever going to feel comfortable talking to a journalist, and if you also say at the same time that soliciting information from people who have access to classified information is a criminal activity. That is unheard of in the United States of America, and I think there should be more that happens to Mr. Holder than just a review of his own decision to sign that warrant. James Goodell, who was a lawyer who was very close to me during my ordeal at the Times, and who represented the New York Times in the effort of the government to stop the publication of the Pentagon Papers in 1971, said that the Justice Department's secret seizure of reporters' phone and email records and its use of official press passes to track reporters' movements in government buildings makes President Obama's record on press freedom worse than President Nixon. That's really something. But coming from James, Ro James Goodale, it's, it, you people must sit up and listen. The situation in your country is far more difficult than it is for us. The trade-off between protecting national security for us and preserving our First Amendment freedoms was not really clear until 9-11. Israelis have lived with this for a much, much longer time. 
You have, I'm happy to say, a uh, much stronger law, d d judicial, judicial decision. You don't have, apparently, a shield law, the kind of law that I was fighting for, but I'm no longer fighting for, for reasons that are almost too technical to describe today. But you have a better court decision than we have. I think uh, I was, I'm now, a, I'm a student of this remarkable book that I hope will be trans translated into English because uh, we need a work like this. But uh, you have a, a better decision than ours. Ours was in 1972, and it basically said that reporters like me have no right not to appear before grand juries to testify about our sources. We have to do that if the, the issue involved is of such great substance that it warrants it. That, that suggests a balancing test, but the reporter was still ordered to testify as I was uh, before a grand jury. Uh, but, but you understand immediately the consequences of a leak that jeopardizes true national security. I would raise this question for you, though. To what extent, and I've heard this from my Israeli journalist friends who are extraordinarily creative at getting around some of the constraints and the rules that are put in place that limit the publication of information, but still, every time I talk about a national security item that's been censored by the government, I'm told, is it really a national security item, or is this a political embarrassment to a government? I think your democracy res wrestles with this issue just as ours does. This is a smaller country, so more is known by a great many more people. In the United States, we have to fall back not on an informal grapevine that kind of sets a consensus, but on the law. So for us, these judicial decisions, what happens to Eric Holder in this case, whether or not James Rosen is apologized to or Attorney General Holder steps down, all of these things will be tremendously significant for us. But I think what you can help us with is teaching how people in a democracy strike this balance. How do you decide when the publication of an embarrassing information is justified, even if it may jeopardize national security? I don't think anyone has a clear answer to that. And I think striking the balance is very, very difficult. But my guess is that because you've thought about this issue for so much longer and dealt with it for so much longer, and you have such a vibrant, active, and determined press, with all of the problems that all of reporters have everywhere, you're more likely to provide some initial clues as to solutions that advance both the protection of our societies and the preservation of a free press long before my country does. In any event, I'm delighted to be here. I always learn something when I come to Israel. Um, I actually suggested if anybody has a few questions, we could do that. Uh, I haven't talked about my own case, my own situation very much because I'm publishing a book in the fall, uh, I'm sorry, in, in early next year. Um, Bradley Manning will be over, but the issue will remain by then, and uh, it will deal, my book is a memoir of being a journalist in an era of national security peril, and I hope it is translated into Hebrew. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for your attention. <laughs>